Did you see God? The reason the universe exists is for sentient beings to come to a deeper understanding of their connection with the universe. All of this is part of, quote, heaven. It's all part of afterlife experience. When I came back from my coma, I knew that if you try and label this, well, this is God. No, it's all of Forget that debate. They're all pointing to the same powerful presence deep at the core of the universe. It's where we become bigger and bigger swathes of what the universe is presenting to us. We all have access to that, which I would say is the very source of our conscious awareness. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered if heaven is real or what's on the other side, then do we have the Proof of Heaven show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Evan Alexander about one of the most powerful and profound NDEs ever experienced and recorded. So welcome back to the show, Evan. Are you ready to shine? Absolutely, Michael. It's great to be back with you. Thanks so much for having me back on. Well, thank you so much for being here and a mighty woohoo. Who is right? <laughs> so and and at the end we'll have a roo-roo. <laughs> Before we dive right into things, what were you teaching at Harvard? Well, neurosurgery. I mean, I was I rose to the ranks of associate professor of neurosurgery. I wrote more than 150 peer-reviewed uh, scientific articles and book chapters. Uh, you know, I was deeply into kind of the the scientific side of of modern neurosurgery and neuroscience. What would you tell someone if they came to you with a near-death experience story? Well, what I would do is I would listen and pay attention to what they were saying. Uh, and, uh, you know, these fantastical, amazing worlds and realms that people have encountered. I could have heard one of those stories. In fact, I did hear that several times from patients. And, um, you know, I would never take away hope. Uh, but generally, if they were open-minded, I would say the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. So you can just forget about it. <laughs> Obviously, I've learned a lot since then. Let, let's pause you there, then. We've set the stage there is no consciousness outside of yourself. And then the anvil dropped. What <laughs> happened November 10th, 2008, as you were primed for nothing of the sort? Right. In fact, I would say up till the night before, my life was kind of swimmingly, sleepily, kind of mundanely following an expected pathway. And the knocking came in the form of waking up at 4.30 in the morning with horrific back pain and soon realizing I had an even worse horrific headache, grand mal seizures, and I was gone from this world from, for seven days. Uh, so that's kind of what it looked like going in. So then let's, I want to break this down and I'm going to walk you through this step by step. I can't believe I'm going to ask this question as a first one though. Did you end up in hell? Well, I, first of all, I don't believe there's anything like a true hell out there, any kind of permanent uh, damnation. But what I did do was I went through uh, uh, what I call the earthworm's eye view. And often when, I, when people would hear about that, it was a very foreboding. And they go, oh, my gosh, that must have been frightening. But the other thing is I was amnesic. Uh, it's one of the atypical features of my NDE. But there it is. I'm just reporting the facts as they occurred. And that amnesia meant that I had no language, I had no memories of Evan Alexander's life, I had none of the religious beliefs, I had none of the scientific knowledge gained over 54 years of honing a very conventional scientific worldview. Every bit of that was completely erased for this experience. And in looking back on it in the months and years afterward, it became clear that one potential reason for all that had to do with the fact that... Um, I had to go through kind of a generic set of experiences that didn't necessarily have a spirit guide, for example, that was my adoptive father. If I had scripted the whole thing, my adoptive father, who had passed over four years before my coma, he was a world-renowned neurosurgeon. He was very uh, spiritual, believed in God and power of prayer, very scientific, very influential in my life. Uh, and he would have been there front and center as my spiritual guide, but he wasn't. My spiritual guide in Sedad, as I've discussed in the book Proof of Heaven, uh, turned up in the next layer of the journey, uh, and that was beyond that earth where my view, where I ascended through a musical kind of pathway of uh, what I'd call a wormhole or portal up into a much richer, ultra-real uh, place I call the Gateway Valley. 
W- uh, would you call that heaven? Well, I would say that is all of this is part of, quote, heaven. It's all part of afterlife experience. You know, the foreboding part, the earthworms I view that for a long time, uh, for at least months after my coma, I was trying to just say was the best consciousness that my brain could muster while it was soaking in pus and the neocortex was being destroyed. Um, and yet I had these incredible oases of brilliant spiritual existence far beyond anything else uh, I've ever lived through uh, that occurred as is made very apparent in the medical case report on the medical records that came out in, uh, in 2018. That case report pointed out just how damaged my neocortex was. There was no place in my brain to construct any kind of dream or hallucination or confabulation. That's one of the reasons why the scientific community takes my story so seriously. But the, the issue is I thought initially that the, that earthworm I view, that very primitive core is kind of foreboding subterranean reality was consciousness being produced by a brain soaking in pus. But then the spiritual reality beyond that was just shocking. So let's, let's go through each step. You, you, I don't know if awake is the right term. You end up, maybe that's the best way to put it, sort of like a dream where we don't know what's past, we don't know what's future, we have no way of determining time. You're right. in this earthworm's eye view. First off, what was that? What did it feel like? What were you experiencing? Well, I would say, you know, in my study of NDEs in the years since, uh, one of the books I read early on was uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Yes. And, of course, in the Bardos, uh, they're describing a lot of what I feel very strongly I witnessed in that realm. So my early assumptions that this was just, you know, peculiar to my journey and to kind of my brain soaking in pus, et cetera, was, was not correct, that in fact it was a more general region that people can pass through. And I, I do believe people can get stuck there, too. They can get stuck there if their belief systems might stick them there, like if you're an absolutely militant uh, kind of atheist materialist, uh, you might not even appreciate the options available when you wind up in that kind of you know a purgatorial uh, uh, entry foyer to the spiritual realms. And, uh, you know, and the other thing to mention is if I had just had the earthworm's eye view yeah. and then come back to this world, I would have probably been describing what uh, people often refer to as a hellish NDE or a negative NDE, which in the, in the broad literature of NDEs are maybe three to 5% of cases. You could easily argue that they're more underreported mm-hmm. than positive NDEs. So maybe that number is relatively higher. Uh, but the bottom line is most NDEs are very, very positive, affirming. In fact, it's uh, hard to convince souls to come back to this world. They love it so much. But that's why it's also important to stress in the same breath that the modern study of consciousness, it supports the reality of all this, also strongly supports the reality of reincarnation. So in other words, if you buy into uh, my my kind of religious beliefs of before my coma, which were very conventional uh, kind of vanilla Methodist teachings from growing up in North Carolina, uh, you know, reincarnation wasn't in the picture. And yet the scientific evidence for reincarnation is really overwhelming. And the only reason I mention that at this juncture is I do know of people who have been so tempted when they hear descriptions of the afterlife that they commit suicide to get there. And that's a giant mistake, because what those are doing is they're bypassing and neglecting some of the main issues that they were supposed to face in this lifetime. And so what happens is with reincarnation, you just get those same issues that you did not resolve here unless you can resolve them in the life review. And of course, many suicides would come to a great resolution in the life review and realize how much love was there for them, how much love there was in the universe for them. And they never would have committed suicide. Uh, But it's important to stress for those who are not aware of the bigger picture here that you don't escape hardships and difficulties in this life by, you know, retreating to the spiritual realm through suicide. That does not work. We're here to live these lives and make these choices. And the more we can learn and grow through this existence, the better. Uh, And that's what this bigger discussion is really all about. Thank you. I've got to ask, since you just put the gauntlet down, scientific evidence, and we have had on many experts on uh, NDEs and reincarnation, life after life, scientific evidence of reincarnation, you said? Yes, absolutely. 
I would say all, all you got to do is go to UVA yep. DOPS yep. dot org. That's the University of Virginia yes. Division of Perceptual Studies. They're a scientific group of very sophisticated professors of consciousness and everything about consciousness. They study near-death experiences. They study past life memories in children, indicative of reincarnation. They study all manner of parapsychological phenomena, telepathy, psychokinesis. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. But this is an academic scientific group that's done rigorous work in this field. Uh, and, and the proof is there. And then also, if you want more, uh, there's a beautiful um, uh, essay contest that was just conducted last year with $1.8 million in prize money. And this was from Robert Bigelow, an aerospace engineer out in Las Vegas. And what he did was he asked the question, what is the best scientific evidence for uh, continuation of consciousness beyond permanent bodily death? 29 winning essays. They're all available to the reading public for free right now. Bigelowinstitute.org. In fact, if you start reading this, you will never, ever doubt the absolute definitive reality of afterlife and reincarnation. They're, they're absolutely part of our existence. Thank you. So let's go from there. You're coming out out of this earthworm's view. There is a spinning melody, which is interesting. I think that term is called synesthesia. Basically, you're seeing, you're seeing sound and you're hearing uh, sight. There's this spinning melody in Gateway. You come out into... To me, it's the sky, although I don't know which moment you found yourself in the sky, and it feels like you've just been birthed. What in the world is going on? It's an astonishing realm to describe. You often hear that these journeys are ineffable, that our language is inadequate to describe them. Your eyes are selecting certain things. They, of course, remember that they only are privy to electromagnetic wavelengths. The comparison is, if you look at all possible electromagnetic spectrum, uh, what we can see with the eyes compared to that whole spectrum is like the paint on the roof of the Empire State Building compared to its entire height. That's how much we're missing. We're only the paint. So, you know, our eyes are extremely limited to what they perceive, our ears, all of that. And then our, our brain continues to filter and restrict information down to this tiny trickle of apparent awareness of a here, now, and a sense of self. Very, very different from the spiritual realm where it's like drinking consciousness from a fire hose. And it's because we come to know things there, what I call uh, knowledge through identification. It's where we become bigger and bigger swathes of what the universe is presenting to us. And uh, that's why, for example, the life review commonly described in NDEs going back thousands of years across all cultures and belief systems, the life review is a beautiful example of because it's not just a vague uh, sepia-tinted memory of events in life, it's a reliving in powerful, profound fashion as the universe is helping us to learn and teach the lessons of our existence. And that's where we revisit the main uh, episodes in our life that still hold residual possibilities for free will choices and soul growth. Uh, and so the life review is a beautiful example of, of how that stage of operations includes a tremendous amount of information uh, input. Most often, those experiences are from the emotional perspective of others around us. Yeah. So they're not only even from our perspective, which means the, that the, the kind of myth of a sense of self and a private consciousness is no longer active in those realms. Our consciousness is much more part of this universal consciousness and this overlap of consciousness that includes all of our loved ones and you know, all of our fellow beings. And uh, that's what is so astonishing in that realm is that you experience these things by becoming huge scenes of it. In fact, when you uh, read Proof of Heaven, what I tried to convey was as I ascended through these levels, especially going from that ultra real gateway valley uh, up through the angelic choirs to the core realm, the entire higher dimensional multiverse, I saw all collapsing down. The material world, four-dimensional space-time. I saw spiritual, uh, the spiritual realm at that gateway valley uh, and all the different ordering events there. I mean, when you think about it, if you've c compressed all of your key elements of your life and you relive them to experience it as a part of teaching, uh, you can imagine just how grand the possibilities are for that kind of aspect of the universe. Um, and, and yet the core realm 
all of that was shrunken down to this complex oversphere, and then it expanded even more to infinite dimensional space throughout all of eternity, uh, and, and the lessons learned. I mean, you say these words, and it, you know, people have great difficulty understanding it because they sound almost nonsensical, and yet it's the best I can do. But to answer your question, the bottom line is that theater of operations and of knowing and of information flow is so much grander than what we're used to here that uh, the language that works well for a trip to Disney, Disney World does not work so well for these kind of journeys. Thank you. So I want to go in about a dozen different directions. So we're going to fasten our seatbelts here. First off, <laughs> you said knowledge through identification. What does that mean? It means that what the universe is showing us, we live. We, it, it becomes like those scenes in a life review. You are in it and you are, are viewing it from this much higher perspective where, you know, in the ambience of the love and the healing and the wholeness of that realm, any departure from that kind of uh, perfection and love and kindness, compassion is, is glaringly obvious. That's why the general lesson that indie years bring back to this world is we we're all in this together. We need to work it out together where, you know, if you hurt another, you're hurting yourself. One way Karen and I like to put it in our workshops and in our presentations is that the golden rule, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated, is written into the very fabric of the universe through these life reviews that go back, you know, at least to the uh, writings of Plato 2,400 years ago. And uh, what he says to his fellow soldiers uh, just before they light up the funeral pyre, thank goodness, is that you go through a, uh, you know, your life flashes before your eyes, you go through all these meaningful events. And what is most important is how much love you were capable of sharing with the world. You know, and the same story could come out of a, a battlefield NDE in, in the modern world, you know, in, in Russia's uh, uh, attack on Ukraine. You could have soldiers, uh, you know, having near-death experiences that would describe these be this beautiful love. And you come back and what a, what a complete mismatch to come back to a material world so filled with hatred and violence when you realize that our ultimate essence as spiritual beings is one of peace and love and kindness, compassion, forgiveness, mercy. I mean, what the heck? Okay, this will be a dangerous turn. We've been talking with people who channel the angels, and at this point I channel the angels as well, about Russia and Ukraine and about the timing of what's going on in Earth. As you've unpacked your learnings, because this is now many years later, and the biggest difference between, I, the, between uh, uh, Eben the Third, who I see now, and Eben the Third, who I saw before, is before it was still so new that you were not as grounded as you are now. You are much right. more grounded now. Yes. And, and so we're playing at a higher level because you're also connected at the lower level. And I don't right. mean that as ranking things. With that said... Do you have a perspective of what's going on in the world today? And do you think it's happening at this time for a reason? Yes, I think all of this is happening for a reason. Uh, now, for example, when you, when you study uh, addiction and alcoholism, what you find um, is that it's the ego mind that is getting you in trouble. And that ego is presenting lots of trouble in our current world through ego amplification in politics and militarization, et cetera. Uh, and so what you find is that uh, often in addiction and alcoholism work, when the ego is you know, rearing its little juvenile head and demanding its, it, its needs be met, uh, you, a therapist might often do an ego sacrifice because the ego would much rather see the host dead than itself dead. That's why, <laughs> you know, we've had so much trouble with addiction and alcoholism, all of that uh, horrible stuff uh, is ego disease. And the same thing is true of our world at large. In fact, Karen and I often talk about that gift of desperation. That's, that's yes. what you talk about in addiction work. Gift of desperation is hitting a bottom that's just enough that it energizes your bounce up to where you come back into a living of a, a more a beautiful, wholesome life and not trying to destroy yourself. Uh, likewise, our world today is facing a collective gift of desperation. And I would say that in my mind, it has come packaged um, with many things. I mean, I, I've always, ever since my coma, I've had to look at the dark side, the bright side, and everything in between to make sense of it all. And I believe that hardships are gifts. 
illness, injury for the individual can be beautiful gifts. It's how we grow to accept and then come to embrace ourselves and see how much the universe loves us uh, from growing into that higher soul. And I believe that's what the world is now challenged to do. With that said, I want to go, I can't believe I'm going to say it this way. I want to go to God. I want to go to the core. Did you meet, I'm going to put it in quotes, God? Absolutely. The important thing to understand is when I say that, do not think Evan Alexander's ego had this wonderful little fun trip speaking to a big guy with a beard you know, on a golden throne. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a, a story that's been told by indie ears going back thousands of years across all belief systems. And that is coming in connection with a beautiful, benevolent, loving force of ambience, of home, of our spiritual home that is so comforting that the majority of souls who venture there on a near-death experience actually would rather stay there. So that comfort of that loving source, that God force. And also I would say that all of our religious systems, bar none, have emerged from prophets and mystics who have touched those non-physical realms. Just like any NDE or near-death experiencer in the modern era, they've had some kind of experience in meditation and prayer uh, through a you know, physiologic challenge that brought them near death, whatever it was. The interesting thing is those religious systems that evolved from the prophets and mystics from a few experiences uh, you know, over thousands of years, that's what people tried to take with religious systems to teach others. Now, of course, people can get there through prayer and meditation, but the universe got tired of that uh, over time, and in the late 60s, uh, doctors developed techniques to resuscitate people after cardiac arrest. So what that means is whereas before the 60s, uh, you know, so many hundreds of millions, billions of those people went on to die, but since cardiac uh, resuscitation techniques have become prominent in medicine, We've now saved tens of millions of people around the world from cardiac arrest. So they dipped in, they were beginning that dying process, had these extraordinary visions of that loving, peaceful, incredibly uh, uh, healing and wholesome force, that God force. And I, I also, please know, when I came back from my coma, I knew that if you try and label this, well, this is God, no, it's Allah, no, it's Brahman, no, it's Vishnu, no, it's Jehovah, no, it's Yahweh, no, it's Great Spirit. Forget that debate. They're all pointing to the same powerful presence deep at the core of the universe, which I would say is the very source of our conscious awareness. We all have access to that because it's the very source of our being. And that's why uh, we should start to develop our relationship with that loving force. And when it comes to uh, you know telling our ego to go into time out for a little while in meditation or centering prayer, then so be it. The little ego voice can go into time out. But there's an aspect of us that is all much greater than that. And that's what indie ears bring back to this world, uh, you know, in a huge volume. And that is this notion that we're all connected through that God force and that the appropriate way to make choices in this world uh, is out of love and kindness and compassion when necessary forgiveness acceptance, mercy, all of these beautiful concepts that are deep at the core of every religious uh, tradition, uh, you know, are full force brought out in near-death experiences with life reviews and this beautiful focus on a loving personal uh, deity right there at the core. Thank you. What did, out of this inky darkness, so you went, you went first off in, into the light, you're traveling on a butterfly wing. I really want to get to know in a little bit who was your traveling companion. You're looking down at this amazing world beneath you. In fact, recently I was doing an exercise with my eyes open while wearing something called a mindfold. It, it blocks you. You can have your eyes open and you're looking in pitch darkness. And I was looking at this floor, these flowers before me that don't exist here on earth. It was something even more beautiful. And I imagine that's what you were seeing. But then you go up, up, up into the heavens, past these giant, I'll call them cumulonimbus clouds, and all of a sudden you're in this our inky darkness. What was it you saw or felt or heard or all of it at once? The core. And, and remember that the ascent up there, the journey up from the earthworm's eye view through the brilliant ultra-real gateway valley uh, and then to this higher level also involved witnessing 
the dissolution and collapse of various stages of kind of the illusion, as I would put it, the material realm, four dimensional space time, all of that collapsing down. And then that whole different ordering of causality in the spiritual realm. That's the kind of ordering that would allow, say, the growth of a soul through witnessing life review, going through uh, planning next incarnations with reunion with uh, souls of, de of departed loved ones, etc. That kind of stuff. But then all of that collapsing down. Thank you. Since we're talking the core, what did it look like or what did it sound like? What was the yes. frequency? All of it. Well, it was uh, it was absolutely it's it's almost indescribable, but it was of of extreme peace. It was a world of of paradox where all the you know light, dark, good, bad, of uh, uh, you know male, female, all the little polarities and and uh, issues of this world come together as one unified whole in that realm. And of course, that's why God is not a he or a she. That God is an infinite. Uh, of oneness, of awareness, of love, of connection that completely bypasses all of our typical little uh, descriptions of you know where things are on a certain spectrum of description. Now, as I described in Proof of Heaven, also in that core realm, it was an infinite inky blackness. It had infinite dimensions. I had the whole higher dimensional multiverse. What does that mean? At that level of reality, uh, is the, about the only way to describe kind of the perfection and the unification of it is it's like a sphere in infinite dimensional space. And it was one that was infinitely kind of recursive. Uh, and uh, I mean, for example, what I would witness in that realm, and it took me a long time to understand this, but my visions that supported my coming back to this world and knowing of the afterlife and knowing of life reviews and reincarnation. I didn't have an Eben Alexander life review because remember, I was amnesic. It wouldn't work. But what I did have were two incredible visions in the core, one I call the flying fish version. And that was uh, in one of the early passes through the core in which I, I, my awareness was that of a flying fish. And we were zipping along together underwater. And that's the material realm. That's living these lives, temporarily dumbed down, not knowing what our souls know, you know, between lives and in life reviews and all that kind of world. But down here in this lowly realm where we're, we have program forgetting, we intentionally forget certain things from between lives and past lives. The scientists who study past life memories in children will tell you, get those memories before age five or six, because they're natural processes that cover them over, so that most of us as adults don't have those memories of past lives, but they can be recovered through NDEs, meditation, what have you. Um, but but uh, at any rate, in this core realm, um, the um, um, experiencing of all that, living through it all, seeing this resolution of paradox, being taught many lessons, that flying fish vision, we would then pop up out of the water. That's where we reunite with higher souls, uh, go through life reviews, plan next incarnation to dive back in. The next vision happened on a different passage through the core. And this one was a real mind bender. It's what I call the Indra's net version of, of, of reality of my core journey. And that was this absolutely stunning, higher dimensional, interconnected network of interwoven threads of the lives of sentient beings going through all of their incarnations. It was like breathing. Inhale is being in the material world. Exhale is dying from that thing, going into the uh, afterlife and between lives, life reviews, planning incarnations, and then inhale again the next incarnation. It was that beautiful, that organic, this incredible richness. Uh, and it all went towards this beautiful golden globe of absolute perfection as kind of the, the end point across the horizon, way beyond any kind of horizon of earth time and, and humanity, but this deep sense that it has a tremendous meaning and purpose. And in that endless net vision, uh, life reviews, higher souls, eternity of soul, every bit of it was writ large. I mean, it was just absolutely astonishing. Uh, but it took me years to understand what those visions were and what they were trying to teach me. And a lot of that uh, kind of journey has been accomplished through meditation. And that's one of the reasons I am so grateful to Karen Newell, to Sacred Acoustics, because I use those meditations an hour or two a day. And they've been a tremendous part of my mind kind of being able to fully harvest 
some of the deepest and most profound aspects of my journey, not just to recover uh, memories of, of, of that uh, NDE, but to actively engage. In fact, if you read Living in a Mindful Universe, I tell the story there of how I finally encountered the soul of my adoptive father, the one who, I, if I had scripted it, he would have been there front and center to be my spirit guide. And he even told me uh, in meditation, you know, two and a half years after my coma, uh, that he was part of that whole package with that beautiful guardian angel on the butterfly wing that was so essential to my interpretation of the story. But as he put it in this meditative vision, he could not be, quote, apparent to me uh, at that time. Because if he had been, uh, I would have tempted, in spite of the fact it was a one in you know 10 million diagnosis, E. coli meningitis in an adult, one in a billion recovery, which is crystal clear uh, you know, from proof of having the medical details, the case report, in spite of those odds, if my father had been the spirit guide, I would have been more tempted to say, you know, maybe I imagined it. It was wishful thinking. Yeah. I would have been a little more likely to kick it out the window because to me it seemed way too real to be real. And to have that guardian angel instead be that beautiful, uh, uh, soft-haired, uh, blue-eyed woman on the butterfly wing, that was, uh, that was the absolute mind-bender about this. And, now, uh, she was your sister. She was my birth sister who I never met. And that's a bit of a spoiler alert because that's really how the book Proof of Heaven kind of comes together at the end with the oh my God uh, incredibleness to it. But there's, there's a ton more to that story. So I haven't, I haven't told too much. But that's in essence. And, and of course, uh, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's still, uh, you know, my eyes missed up, my heart pounds, and I can feel her presence just for remembering that. You, you don't have to worry about a spoiler alert because I've had over 2,000 shows now, and, <laughs> and your, your description is still the best of the best of the best, not from an egoic point of view of saying, uh, Eben, what you wrote, but there were so many sacred omniscience <laughs> by the universe. First off, the amnesia of you. Secondly, people not being with you who you know and not having the quintessential version of an NDE, which I believe allowed you to dive deeper and to have the mind to be able to bring it back and to have the, I'm going to call it the quizzical mind, the mind going, what, what in the world just happened? To be able to describe it so well that it, I, I've read this time after time and it's, it's worth reading again. So what were you told? We're talking about source and core. You said, I saw the multisphere and I was told. That I was not there to stay. Now, this is not words, of course, but the conceptual flow that was delivered into my mental space. Every time I entered that core, you are not here to stay. We'll teach you many things. You'll be going back. In fact, I'd even come to believe after multiple passages through that series of levels, Earth where my view, Gateway Valley, core realm, that going back went going back to the earth where my view. So I'd already kind of accepted, well, what's the big deal about that? Because I knew by conjuring up the musical notes in my mind, I could bring that, that portal back up and get into the gateway valley and then back up into the core realm. But they weren't kidding. And as I tell in the book Proof of Heaven, there came a time when I could no longer use the memory of those mus musical notes to conjure up that portal to uh, get back into the Gateway Valley. So I was now stuck in that earthworm's eye view. And that's where I also describe seeing the, the thousands of beings going off into the distance, heads bowed, this murmuring energy. And when I wrote it all up weeks later, I call that the power of prayer. And in many ways, it was kind of drawing me back. I still didn't, still didn't know back to what. And that's where I then saw the six faces that it would bubble up out of the muck, say a few words, go back into the muck. I never understood the words, uh, but the faces I remember as sharply uh, as if the th whole event happened this morning. I mean, those faces, the way they appeared, are burned into my memory, just as the whole experience was. And it turns out they were faces of people who were in the ICU room the last 24 hours I was in coma, except, of course, for one exception. And that was Susan Riches, all that described in the book Proof of Heaven. But it turns out that she was good at channeling, at getting to people in coma and helping them heal. She wrote a book called Third Eye Open. Her name is Susan Riches. And of course, when I woke up in the ICU room, my brain was still completely gobsmacked by this experience. So I didn't recognize my mother, my sisters, my sons, former spouse at the bedside. I had no idea who these beings were. 
all I knew was where I had just been. Uh, and then, but uh, memories, language, uh, all that stuff came back within hours, days. It was just an incredible return. In fact, all of my knowledge and memory, semantic knowledge of physics, cosmology, all my personal memories came back over two months. And when they came back, they were more complete than they had been before coma. And we go into all that in Living in a Mindful Universe to discuss memory. There's never been any case suggesting that memories are stored in the brain. Thank you. Let's go back to the core. What was God trying to teach you? It's very simple. And it's a lesson that has been taught in that same uh, kind of encounter, you know, billions of times. And that is that we are all one. We are all connected. We're all evolving together. Kindness, compassion, and mercy are absolutely essential for how we treat each other. And this is all about the evolution of consciousness itself. In other words, this view of reincarnation is not some blind mechanistic wheel that you're trying to get off of. But in fact, the notion is filled with grace with metamorphosis, with transformation. Butterflies in that realm are much more than just a symbol. I remember hearing stories of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was yes. one of the great uh, leading investigators to get us on uh, knowing the reality of the afterlife, uh, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, as a young nursing student, uh, went through Dachau, the concentration camp, right after it was liberated in May of 1945. And what she saw in one of the barracks that had housed a lot of the children, was she saw they had carved butterflies into the wooden walls. And she came away wondering, why butterflies? And she came to realize in all of her work, she saw butterflies again and again. It's not a symbol. It's not a metaphor. This is an absolute reality of experience. Uh, I remember, for example, the Joplin tornado that killed you know, many people in Joplin, Missouri 10, 15 years ago. And they did a mural to heal the children that had survived that. And many of the children started drawing these beautiful little kind of fairy butterfly-like -like creatures in the mural. And when asked, what are those? They said, that is what led me away. That was a real angelic appearance. I mean, it brings tears to my eyes to even think about it now. It's not a symbol of metamorphosis. This is absolute reality about encounters in the spiritual realm of, uh, you know, kind of guides and... and uh, um, you know, intentional uh, evidence from that God force of love in the universe to help nudge us in the right direction. That is why I wrote a butterfly wing. The lady next to you, as you're flying on the butterfly wing, what was she projecting or telling you or sharing with you? The message from her, it was delivered telepathically. She never had to say a word, uh, but her emotional awareness and deep, profound truth came into my mind. And when I wrote all that up weeks later, the message conveyed to me, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. There is nothing to fear. You are cared for. And of course, the other piece there in Proof of Heaven was you can do no wrong. And I wish I'd explained that much better in Proof of Heaven. I thought by that point, people would understand that ambience of love, it meant that every choice and action we make needs to be directed towards love, kindness, compassion for others, uh, because that was kind of the ultimate truth that was being presented to me. And I would say the, the bigger message here about existence, uh, given that uh, we've come to realize how much of, of, of this um, physical reality emerges from the realm of the mental in a form of top-down causality, I found myself uh, greatly admiring the words of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who wrote a beautiful book in the mid 20th century, The Phenomenon of Man. Mm -hmm. And he made it very clear during a debate at that time, you know, on, on Darwinian evolution, when people were wondering, well, you know, how real is it? And of course, everybody in science was beginning to discover how powerful uh, Darwinian evolution was as a concept. But Teilhard de Chardin, who was a paleontologist, so he's a scientist, and he was a French Jesuit priest. So he also had plenty of spiritual uh, knowledge in his uh, life. Uh, but he came to see that evolution was happening, but it was much, much bigger than just some puny little version of uh, so biological selection on one little planet, but that, in fact, all of sentience throughout the universe uh, was growing and transforming. And I would say that's what this is all about, coming into wholeness. 
whether at the individual coming into this kind of knowledge, getting into meditation, centering prayer, uh, working to bring peace and harmony to the world, or the world at large, all of us, all cultures, uh, you know, the uh, hardships that we talked about earlier, the uh, collective gift of desperation for this world at large with warfare and, and climate change and uh, economic polarization, all these things are the kind of challenges that can actually lead to tremendous growth. And that's what I believe is going on. Just like that old saying, all politics is local, uh, you know, likewise, all evolution of consciousness throughout the universe is nothing more than individual sentient beings coming to a deeper understanding of their own relationship with the universe at large and its fundamental nature. And that's where I believe this tremendous journey of awakening is taking us. And it's none too soon uh, for this world to get on board. It's time for Homo sapiens to wake up to true wisdom. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more question based on that, and then I want to get the, just whatever the key, the key learnings that you are unpacking now, because as I understand from my NDEs, certain things I unpacked right away, certain things came later. All I knew is that the, the level of download and understanding, I, I couldn't even figure out at the time, and they all start to pop up over time. But you said something really profound and you said you didn't break it down well in the book because you thought it'd be a bit much to, for people at the time. Right. You can do no wrong. Right. What that essentially means, and it, it goes in parallel with the first words I said uh, that I don't remember, but my family certainly was shocked and reported uh, when I first came out of coma after they removed the breathing tube. And I went, thank you. <laughs> I then went, all is well. And I was sitting there, like, and my sister described me as like this little Buddha <laughs> sitting on the bed going, all is well. Don't worry. I was reassuring all of them that everything was fine. So here's this guy who's been in coma for a week yeah. due to a severe case of bacterial meningoencephalitis that by all a medical account should have been fatal or at least uh, you know, left me uh, drooling on my shoelaces in a nursing home for the rest of my life. That's not what happened. Uh, and this amazing healing is a huge part of the story. But it really is about that notion that we are divine and sacred spiritual beings coming into a knowing of who we are. And that all is well is simply a reflection that if we follow our heart and if we follow these lessons and these kind of deep spiritual truths that we can come in touch with, through meditation, through familiarizing ourselves with NDEs, with the amount of healing, you know, physical healing, emotional, mental healing that can come from spiritual healing of those who are aware of all of this, uh, that's what will heal this world. And so that notion of you can do no wrong, what it really means is, you, is we have the choice of free will. We have the choices in how we treat ourselves and others. And that is the biggest and most profound lesson is that we're responsible for our choices. And therefore, true, you can do no wrong, but it depends on what you want to go through in that life review. I'm convinced that our notions of hell yeah. come from life reviews of people who are busy handing out so much pain and suffering to others that when they left this world, that life review where they had to receive it all was not very much fun. What's interesting to me, the further that I go down the spiritual rabbit hole, the more that I understand that paradoxes are held hand in hand. To me, they're just the opposite side of the same coin. Right. Uh, uh, good, bad, boy, girl, whatever you want to call it, all of these are one. And so what you just said there was in the, in a very interesting paradox. You said, you can do no wrong and everything matters. Yeah, right. Well, we learn by experience. And if you want to have a life review, you know, that's unpleasant, go on and treat everybody miserably and then see what it, what it comes down to. Uh, but, you know, given all the evidence, uh, that Bigelow evidence, uh, all the scientific evidence for the fact that this is real, we're not, you know, this is not some make-believe woo-woo nonsense, but, you know, the afterlife is real and a sense of incredible responsibility for our choices and sense of oneness and love and compassion at the very core of it all. Yes, it's real. Let's start living our lives as human beings and interacting as if, wow, now we get it. We've, we've, we've studied the knowledge. We know it's real, and let's live by it. Woohoo! Woohoo is right. <laughs> <laughs> what does love mean to <laughs> Evan Alexander the Third V. 
three. I'm going to say V1 was before it. V2 was right after. I'm speaking with V3 right, right now, which means that you've both integrated and you've said with 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 uh, with Kathy every day for an hour or two, you've been going into the sacred acoustics. You've been going into the sacred space or what I call the hotel key card of the universe, which is frequency. And you've been going back and playing there. So what right. does love mean to you now? It is really just... Uh... It, it's the love that we generally think of, like a parent loving a child or child-parent, uh, romantic lovers, etc. But very importantly, it's an unconditional love. So it's that form of love that is so adoring and, and embracing that it only wants the very best and highest outcome for, you know, fellow beings mm -hmm. and, and without exception. You know, really a deep and profound love. I, I mean, I would say certain prophets, uh, you know, from my upbringing, there's absolutely no question. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, yes, uh, brought this beautiful message of love. And I, I have to stress there, sadly, that doesn't mean that modern Christianity conveyed the teachings of that beautiful prophet of love and kindness, compassion and mercy. Because... Uh, in some ways, our modern religions have tried to control people, and they've actually promoted messages that were very anti the message of the original prophet. And that's where we, we really have to get back to the basics. And that's one of the reasons why I would prefer to make our religious systems, you know, instead of depending on 2,000-year-old texts, uh, you know, and debating uh, their kind of reality and their authorship, why don't we just go with the lessons of today? learned by people dynamically living these experiences. There's a beautiful book by a friend and colleague of mine. It's called The Essence of Religions by Christopher Copps, C-O-P-P-E-S. And he basically compares the five main faiths on earth with the lessons of NDEs and the lessons of love and kindness, compassion from NDEs. And, and the NDEs are the gold standard. They're the very best by far. And, and yet, you can, he marks in that book how different religions come close to that perfection of the gold standard. As far as I'm concerned, let's, you know, why do we have to pay attention to 2,000 year old texts? Why don't we go with modern human experience and these profound kind of understandings and move forward there? I mean, to the extent that the original teachings of a prophet might truly be manifested, fine. But sadly, church fathers have interfered with that narrative over, you know, thousands of years, and that has led to some bad behavior on the behalf of religions. And uh, they've had their 5,000 years to try and teach this golden rule to the world. And to the extent they can still do that, fine. There are many people who have come into peace and love in a true way uh, through their religious uh, teachings. I can tell you that all the church fathers and, and mothers I ever knew, all the the real uh, teachers uh, in both my Methodist church growing up and my Episcopal church as an adult were always, they, they walked the walk. They were the real deal. But sadly, some people try and fake it. Thank you. Two last questions, then I want to find out where people can go to find out more. How do you view, treat, or walk in the world differently with this many years of integration now? Well, I would say it's it's much more <clears throat> appreciating that everybody is doing the best they can with the tools they have at any given moment based on their understandings. And so to give people the benefit of the doubt, try and meet them where they are. I certainly don't expect people to come banging a pathway to my door, you know, to hear what I have to say about anything. But <clears throat> I do want to try and you know, in discussion and conversation with people, meet them where they are and then see how uh, what I've learned through my experience potentially can be of use to them in their endeavors. And so it's really just uh, uh, that simple, trying to uh, take the conversation into that daily basis of where people are in living their daily lives, because ultimately that's where we are doing this soul work. Uh, is here in these lives, and we got to make the most of them. Thank you. And why do you say you have hope? In fact, I almost hear you saying, I have hope more now than ever. Why is that? Well, I, I don't believe any of this has been accidental. And I think a lot of what the world has gone through 
uh, in the last um, few decades, if not centuries, if not millennia, uh, has been, you know, this collective gift of desperation. A lot of it is trying to help nudge us uh, into a far wiser uh, kind of living of our lives. And I believe that is what is happening now. And it can look insane, you know, when you see the kind of madness and the way people treat people. But, I mean, as a, a beautiful example, look at what happened to our world when Putin viciously attacked Ukraine. And then look what the effect was, though. The exact opposite of what he was trying to do. What did he do? He brought, you know, many in the U.S. would have thought our political divide would never resolve. It's a, a beautiful example of how the hardships in life often lead to tremendous growth. And that, I choose optimistically, will ultimately be the catalyst for beautiful growth and transformation. Thank you. On that note, and I had goosebumps more than once as you spoke that, where can people go to find out more and to go to an event you have coming up at the Theosophical Society? Absolutely. Well, you can go to Eben Alexander. That's mm -hmm. E-B as in Baker, E-N Alexander.com. That's a good starting place. And I would encourage people to look through my reading list, more than 100 uh, books, papers, a lot of them with hot links right to the paper, etc., uh, it's categorized. It's a very useful list. Look at my blog postings, a tremendous amount of kind of writing about all this over the years um, and many links to interviews, etc. Go to uh, for the meditation. Go to sacredacoustics.com. Mm -hmm. That's what I use an hour to a day. It's a profound system, differential frequency brainwave entrainment. Uh, you know, we can talk about that another time. Very uh, useful. And we share it with many other indie ears, etc. In addition, I would encourage people to go to uh, uh, unitedinhopeandhealing.com. And that is uh, something that my partner Karen came up with, a brilliant kind of nexus website where there's a lot of free material and some paid material, but a, a very educational. There was a series of webinars we did. They're totally free. These were interviews with many of the people we know, leaders, uh, globally renowned leaders in consciousness studies that we would interview during the pandemic. Uh, and those interviews we did every two weeks for many, many months, those are all available to for free. So united in hope and healing dot com. Uh, also, would like to alert people we'll be doing a shift network course uh, in the fall. And so people can go to shift network to find out much more about that. That'll involve a lot of deep meditation. And then likewise, there's another one, a uh, beautiful uh, course coming up uh, in the near term, May 14th. It's a workshop that Karen and I are offering. It's uh, hosted by the uh, Theosophical Society, which has been a, a, a beautiful ally in so much of the kind of work we've done. Uh, and that is, uh, it's entitled The Role of Spiritual Health mm -hmm. in Soul Growth and Everyday Living. And it'll be a lot of practical tools using meditation, sacred acoustics, to help people come into healing in their own lives. And I encourage people to stay in touch with us through these websites. We have a lot of other oncoming events, interviews, et cetera. Uh, we do a lot of this stuff to try and help this world come to a higher level. And uh, please do uh, stay in touch with me. I love that. Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo is absolutely right. All right, hold on. Let me get Rue, and then I'll, I've got one Rue. more follow-up question. Yep, Rue is his name. Rue, where'd you get that name? I'm wondering. <laughs> mm. Here's here's <laughs> Rue right here. <laughs> ah, get ya. Okay. <laughs> well, let me go grab him here. Be right there. His name originally was. Uh, oh, you're hungry. We'll get you food in a minute, good boy. His name originally was Ruby when we thought he was a she. Uh -huh. uh, and but she had been abandoned on the side of the road after dark, and it was oh, because no. somebody knew that uh, she was a he. So uh -huh. the name was first Ruby, and then became, uh, I think, Ruby Roo, which then became Ruby Roo Roo the Wonder Rooster. Somewhere. There you go, <laughs> Ruby Roo Roo. God, I love it. And he looks like a Wonder Rooster indeed. He is. Wow, He's... that's a beautiful bird. Thank you. Wow, oh wow. He's very deep and very profound and more plugged in. I, I... And of course, he has his moments like anyone else, but he, unlike humans, and I don't understand how it works, he sees emotions. And so if he's in another room and let's say an email comes through and, and the email is disturbing on some level, whatever that means, all of a sudden he will start screaming from the other room. 
Conversely, if he's in the other room and you have a loving thought towards your partner, he actually has these sounds for love that he makes and sounds for hugging, and he will start making these sounds Beautiful. from the other room. That is wonderful. Well, it just reminds us, of course, that animals are part of this beautiful spiritual kingdom we're talking about. They are not separate from it. Mm -mm. Uh, and, um, and we're all connected. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree, Ruru. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. So two last wrap-up things. First off, if there's one thing people can do to help exp uh, expand their on their own personal evolution and as an evolution, as a cell in the human beingness, what is the one thing that you would have people do? <laughs> Other than sing it to the top of the world. <laughs> well, I think singing it to the top of the world is actually not a bad idea. Sharing it with the world, just that simple message of love and compassion, kindness, acceptance, mercy, and attracting people uh, to the power of this, to bring healing and wholeness to those who... Who, who do this. My life, I can tell you, has become much more kind of pleasant and just kind of grounded and comfortable and fulfilling by doing this, by meditating, talking about it, yeah. writing about it, sharing with people, conversations, presentations. Uh, you know, this is a very exciting world way for the world to move forward. So it's really just kind of live this, uh, breathe it, uh, but uh, start to bring this love to the world. The best way to receive the love of the universe is to serve as a conduit and share that love out with all of our fellow beings. Woohoo! Who is right? And, and I think that answered the last question, which is any last words of wisdom. I think you may have just covered that. I think we got, you know, keeping it simple makes a lot of sense. You can get fairly complex about a lot of things, and, uh, but ultimately, so much of this knowledge of uh, brain and mind and consciousness and uh, free will and all that is just making life a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> woo woo, exactly. This is the most. Guru is my kind of rooster. He, he's been on a tear lately at the end of interviews, really singing, uh, but this is the most job. that he has belted it out. So he likes your energy, Evan. There is no <laughs> doubt about it. Well, the feeling is mutual. I love his energy. And I love <laughs> your energy, Michael, and I'm glad you're getting this out to the world. It Thank is fantastic. you. Fantastic. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler and uh, uh, Ruru for that matter, saying be well, have fun, get proof of heaven and everything Dr. Evan Alexander has to offer, and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! Woo what a beautiful interview. What a beautiful interview with Dr. Evan Alexander, proof of heaven, and really the... Um, <laughs> preponderance, the overwhelming evidence that we are spirit, we are energy, having an energetic experience in human form, and how this all does matter, and how love matters. On that note, if you want to connect with the other side of the veil, there's a very simple, easy way to do it. Go to automaticwriting.com. Learn awe, the automatic writing experience. Enjoy one of our live classes where you'll learn automatic writing in the fastest way possible with our entire video-based program, automaticwriting.com, and become the mystic you were meant to be at inspirenationuniversity.com. Join our school of mystics. And of course, if you want behind-the-scenes goodness, click the button below for the Mystic Circle. Lots of behind-the-scenes videos, woo-woo goodness, and much more. Do share this with the world. Big thumbs up if you like this. Click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows, YouTube premieres, live events with me. Here's a link to the next amazing video. Love you guys so, so much and keep on shining bright. How does it get any better than this, Roo? How does it get any better than this? Woohoo! Love you guys. Good job, Roo.